Good morning and welcome to Illuminate Community Church Online. My name is Matt. I just wanna say thank you for tuning in here with us this morning. If you're new, simply scan that QR code right now on the screen. It's our way to get to know you a little bit better. Fill out some basic information. One of our pastors will be reaching out to you this next week. Here at Illuminate, we believe in the importance of church membership. Membership is one of those ways to deepen your devotion and passion to Jesus as well as the local church. If you're not a member here at Illuminate or just wanna learn more on March 26 at our 9.30 a.m. service, we will have a membership orientation. We wanna invite you to join us for that. God is doing some amazing things here at Illuminate and starting next week, we are having three Sunday morning services, an eight, a 9.30 and an 11 a.m. service. And we wanna encourage you to join us live and in person here to experience what God is doing firsthand. And with that all being said, we invite you to join us. We have an awesome service planned for you this morning. We hope you enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together this morning. It's a beautiful day that God's given us. to celebrate a God who's faithful. It's the sun rising in the morning and setting in the evening. So let's sing to him together from the rising of the sun. From the rising of the sun to the ending, to the
is a grace for every single one of us in Jesus Christ. You know these lyrics? Sing with me. Come on. for every single one of us here in this room, those who are with us online that are watching service today. This song, 250 plus years old, has had such an impact on so many of us. I can remember hearing my grandparents sing it in that little church with an attitude piano and an organ. I can remember my parents teaching it to me. I can remember the impact it had on me when I actually understood grace and I could say I once was lost but now I'm found because of you God and so God maybe this is the first time someone's ever heard those lyrics may the truth of the grace of Jesus pour over every single one of us today draw us close as we celebrate God your goodness in the future over these little ones in just a few minutes God we dedicate these kids to you today we're reminded that it's every generation it's up to us 
to respond to that grace and to be bold with the message of Jesus in every single time that we live in. So God, thank you for being the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And thank you for being with us today and reminding us of your grace. We all say together, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church family, both here and online. How are you feeling this morning? What do you think about this beautiful spring day? If you're joining us from Canada, I'm sorry, but it's really gorgeous here this morning. We love you. Hey, um, if this is your first time visiting with us this morning, welcome to the family. And we really do feel like we are a family here. We're more than a church. We're a family. And uh, we're glad you could be with us this morning. want to ask you to do one simple thing. If this is your first or second time and you haven't done it yet, you'll find a card in the seat back in front of you or a QR code taped to the back of the, the chair in front of you or the QR code on the screen as you're watching online and would ask you to just go ahead and scan that QR code, fill out that card, it'll send you to a text connect or a connect card and we'd ask you to fill that out so we could know that you were with us um, today and we also wanna follow up um, tomorrow the next day and just say hey thanks for being with us and joining us as a church family this morning and as a family we get to celebrate today you know we're living in some crazy times and to have a, a group of families stand up and say I want to raise my kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is a pretty bold move so I want to bring up uh, Charlie Courtney who is our director of children's ministry give her some love And we have some folks that are gonna do that. We sure do, good morning. We have three sweet families heading up here today. And this is just a really special time where each one of these families has come up here to declare their desire to raise their children in a Christian household. And any of you who have kids, you know this is not an easy task. So their desire is to come up here, share a prayer for their child or children, and um, ask that you come alongside them through this journey. So at this time, each family's gonna take a moment to share their prayer, and then uh, Pastor Jason will come up and pray over them. Good morning, I'm Holly. This is my husband, Cody, and our son, Luca. Um, and our prayer for Luca, um, is, uh, dear Heavenly Father, we dedicate Luca to you. We pray that you would protect and guide him, be the light unto his path. We pray that he would seek you first and live in obedience to your word. Thank you for blessing us with this most precious gift. I pray that we as his parents will raise him and guide him in a way that honors you. Thank you for choosing us to be Luca's parents. We are forever grateful. In your name we pray. Good morning, everyone. My name is Will Binder. This is Nisha, my wife, and our son, Elijah. Uh, dear Lord, we come to you today to de dedicate the life of our son, Elijah, to be a disciple in your holy kingdom. We praise you for the blessing he has been in our lives and pray that he continues to be a blessing to those he encounters. We value and cherish the love you have for us as your children. We intend to, re to reveal this love, the love of Christ, to Elijah throughout his life. We pray that you will provide us the wisdom to properly guide his heart to you. Elijah, we pick this verse because it reminds us that we have a protector amidst the turbulent journey to our promised land. When life feels overwhelming, don't forget that God is with you and has good things in store for you. Uh, good morning, I'm Taylor. This is my wife, Ashlyn. Maddox and Taylin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful gift of our children, Taylin and Maddox. We thank you for answering our prayers in ways we never imagined. Mostly, we thank you for entrusting us to be their parents. We pray they have the strength to always embrace and follow you no matter where the world pulls them. That they always stand tall in their faith. We pray that you surround our children with good things that they may grow in your will and your ways. Lord, we pray Maddox will grow into the man of God that you created him to be, and that he always holds you first in his heart. We pray Taylin's heart stays fixated on you, that she will not conform to the world around her, but that you transform her mind through your word. 
Lord, give us the strength to raise them with the same grace that you show us in every aspect of our lives. Let us be quick to love, slow to anger. Help us to be the best example of your love that we can be for Taylor and Maddox. Lastly, Lord, we, we just pray that our church family helps us to raise our babies in your light and love, that you help guide us and encourage us and keep us accountable to your word. We know these children are beautifully and wonderfully made, and we pray that, you come to know, that they come to know that too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hi, church. We're the Munson family. I'm Jordan. This is my husband, Kevin, and this is our son, Benaya Asher Munson. He's about to turn three on March 25th, and this is our prayer for him. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of our son, Benaya. We ask that you make yourself known to him at an early age to strengthen him to stand firm in biblical truth, to lead his peers in the direction of godliness, to be wise against the schemes of the devil, that he aligns with your will in all seasons of his life, and for him to be an enduring, good, and faithful servant. My name is Seth, and this is my beautiful wife, Sarah, six. And this is Arthur James, six. It's a little bit hard to see him, but um, let's see. Uh, the prayer we have for him, uh, Father God, let us be a family known for our joy and generosity and the big heart you've given us to love and welcome people. Let Arthur grow in love as he grows in size and help Sarah and I to model the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives as we preach the gospel to him and instill a love for you in him. Help us to see how you've made him and are working in his life and to cooperate with you and what you have in store for him with the gifts and talents that you've made him with. You made him so well. Help him to grow strong in his identity in you. Let us raise him up in the way he should go, not only morally and biblically, but help us to see his personality and passions that you've given him to encourage him and support him in his life ahead. Thank you for the privilege of being his parents. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. Um, we are the Schultz family. My name is Patrick. This is my wife, Kathy, and this is our son, Caleb, who's six months old. And um, we prepared a prayer today for him and raising him. Um, God, please guide us and give us patience as we raise Caleb to be the man you've intended him to be. Help us be conscientious of our words and actions because we know he'll be watching us as his models for how to behave. Help us navigate raising a child in a society whose values don't always match up with our own. And ultimately, please help us remember that he is a blessing you have given us, even on the difficult days. Amen. Mm -hmm. Say a quick word to, to you parents. You're incredibly wise. And you know what gives your kids life. And this is why you're bringing them before your church family. You know, it's been said that it takes a village to raise a child, I totally disagree. It's not a village, it's a family. That's what it takes to raise a child, family, not a village. And that's the blessing of the church. The Apostle Paul calls the church a family. And so we as your extended family wanna commit ourselves to doing whatever we can to help you fulfill your desires for your kids to raise them in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. So we wanna pray for you and over you. If you just reach out a hand to these couples and these kids. Father, we just ask for a special blessing upon each one of these families. Lord, as we've said, nothing will give us greater joy, greater sorrow, nothing will sanctify us like our children. And they are a gift that draws us ultimately closer to you. Father, we pray that they would come to know you. Lord, as their extended family, I pray that you would help us to give whatever it takes to pour into the lives of these young ones to help make the next generation of disciples for Jesus Christ. All for your glory, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Show them some love again, will you please? Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right, everybody. Anybody know what's happening next Sunday? I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. Three services, guys. By God's grace, we want to be able to accommodate all those that he is bringing through our doors. What that means is next Sunday, 
we're adding a third service. So the times are changing slightly. The additional service will begin at 8 a.m., 9.30 and 11 are the two services that follow, 8, 9.30 and 11. For all the other details on who is meeting what, when and where, you can go to the website, call us, let us know. Most importantly uh, is to attend whatever service your friends or family or people that you're trying to reach out to, whatever service is convenient for them, bring them to that service. Outside of that, probably our eight o'clock service might be our thinnest one. And so you can help make space by attending that one if, if, that, uh, if that works for you. Also, I want to let you know that, oh, well, I should say this too. If you see someone from the worship team after the service or in between services or someone from tech or hospitality or really any number of our volunteers, make sure you, you give them a little extra love because they're the ones that are actually helping facilitate these three services. For example, for our worship teams and tech teams, their call times now on Sunday mornings will be 6 a.m. They're gonna be here at 6 a.m. And for the most part, they are all volunteers. These are all volunteers that show up and provide for the people that um, wanna be part of what God is doing here. So if you see one of them, make sure you, you give them some special love for that. So I was with about 125 of our men yesterday up in Williams for a man camp. And I just have to tell you that God is really doing some unique things. Um, he's bringing about uh, a renewed vision and commitment in the hearts of many of our men. I was talking with some of them uh, after one of the um, sessions and the speaker essentially said, what would it mean for you to go all in, men? What would it mean? And so the discussions that ensued after that were just in incredibly compelling. In fact, some men were literally brought to tears. It takes a lot to move a man to tears sometimes. And some of these men are really being faced with some things that they're embracing, which they haven't embraced uh, their entire lives. And so it's gonna be cool to see what God does to that. So I say that to help you understand the way you can participate in facilitating their, their further growth is just by praying, praying that God continues to work in their lives in a very, very profound way. So if you got your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter seven. Over the last couple months, we've been looking at the words of Jesus as he lays down the most profound, greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, 2,000 years ago, north of the Sea of Galilee on a hill. Several thousand people are gathered. Jesus is incredibly popular. And so the sermon today is for anybody who has ever judged another person. <laughs> Little nervous laughter moves through the room. Sermon today is for anybody who's ever judged another person. It is for all of us. Why do we do this? You ever stop to think about it? Why do we, why do we judge other people? We do it so quickly. Why does this happen? Well, I think in large part, this isn't justifiable, but, and it's wrong, but in large part, it's, it's like our way of finding our fit or our place in the world. And so as we judge other people, essentially at the same time, we're, we're judging ourselves a little bit more favorably, typically in, in some way. And we live in this culture that actually promotes this kind of quick judgmentalism. For example, our friends at Tinder, the world's largest dating app, tell us that ladies swipe left 80% of the time. Men swipe left 50% of the time. If you don't know, to swipe left is essentially disapproval, rejection. Women swipe left 80% of the time. No, 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 maybe, yes. Turns out the ladies tend to be a little bit more picky than the guys. Or one could say, perhaps they just have higher standards than men. But statistically speaking, what's happening is that the ladies are competing for a very small pool of desirable men. And guys, chances are you're not one of them. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. So much about our existence is just a matter of quick 
judgments with a swipe. And it almost gets built into the fabric of who we are as as humans. Very often, we couldn't be more wrong in the judgments we make. I read a story about a young man who worked in an office where the boss gave everybody a frozen turkey at Thanksgiving. And so when the day came, the boss said, hey, you know, we've got these frozen turkeys that are being delivered at the end of the day. They're in these bags, and, and just find the one that has your name on it and make sure you take it home with you. And so this young guy's friends thought they would play a, a prank on him, and they replaced the frozen turkey in his bag with a plaster turkey. And so at the end of the day, he finds the bag with his name on it, picks it up, and walks to the bus, gets on, and as he's riding home... He looks across the aisle and he notices this man. It just looks like he's really down on his luck, like something's really bothering him, like like he could use something to lift his spirits. So he thinks, you know, I have this turkey. I really don't need it. I should just give it to him. He thinks thinks about it a little bit more. He's like, "I, I don't know. I don't want the guy to feel like I'm just giving him a handout, you know, like he's charity. So, so he says to him, hey, um, I have, this, I have this frozen turkey. I don't need it. He's like, I'll sell it to you for whatever you have. You know, whatever you want to give me for it, I don't need it. Just whatever you have is fine. So the guy perks up. He's like, well, that would be amazing. You know, reaches into his pocket and pulls out some change and hands it to him. He's like, that's great. You know, shakes the guy's hand, hands over the plaster turkey. Next day, guys arrives, the guy arrives at the office and he says to his buddies, I had the best day yesterday, guys. You're not going to believe what I did. He's like, I was on the bus, and, and I saw this guy next to me. He looked a little disheveled. just looked like he was down on his luck, and so I sold him my turkey for, like, next to nothing, you know, for some pocket change. And he's like, I felt so good. You know, I just did the right thing. And his friends are like, oh, no. What you need to know is we actually replaced your frozen turkey with the plaster turkey. And the guy immediately felt so guilty he immediately leaves the office and goes to the bus and just rides it for the rest of the afternoon trying to find the guy, just trying to make it right. So if we were to judge that man based on the fact that he sold this guy who was down and out a plaster turkey, we would say, dude, your heart is evil. You're rotten inside. But if we judge the man according to his intention, we would say, you know what? That guy's got a good heart. He intended to do well. Very often, we are horribly wrong in the way we judge and the conclusions we make about other people. And so it's no wonder that Jesus actually speaks to it. And what he says is really interesting. And this may surprise you a little bit because what he's gonna say is this. It's actually not wrong to judge There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. But if you do it in the right way, it actually lifts people up. And there's this loving correction that you can bring into someone's life. And by the way, every single person needs that kind of correction, loving correction that is meant to edify and build up. But that's not what happens. In fact, it's this judgmental spirit, critical spirit that seeps into Christianity, and this is the reason why many people reject it. In fact, Gandhi himself said, you know, your Christ I actually like. It's your Christians I have no tolerance for because they're judgmental. So Jesus steps into the space, and he says, no, actually, let me help you understand what, what this means and how to do it, how to do it in the appropriate way. So verse 1, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. How many times have I heard this spoken from Christians as a way to shut other Christians up that are trying to speak into his or her life? So I think we need to go here first because sometimes this is a smokescreen that people throw out there, right? It's like if there's a Christian that's involved in doing something that they know they shouldn't be doing and someone comes alongside and says, 
hey, let me remind you of what the scripture says about the circumstance you're in. And then immediately that Christian responds with, don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. And those are words meant to shut anyone up that tries to speak into a person's life. Uh, that's not what Jesus is, is saying here. You can't quote this verse to support what you're doing knowing that it's in direct violation of what the scriptures say. But Christians often do that. Here's how we know that Jesus isn't forbidding all kinds of judgment because if you drop down to verse six, Jesus actually refers to people as dogs and pigs. We'll talk about that in a second. And I'm pretty sure he's making a judgment call there. So in this passage, Jesus is helping us understand what it means to judge appropriately. Now, what exactly does that word mean? Well, the word judge has a pretty wide bandwidth of meaning. For example, a marksman might say, I missed the target. Why? Because I didn't judge the wind correctly. What's he saying? What he's saying is, I didn't evaluate things in the way that I should have. At the same time, the Bible tells us that God will bring judgment to the earth and there will be condemnation and destruction and it'll be worldwide. What's the difference between those two judgments? Well, one is evaluative and the other brings condemnation. So what Jesus is about to explain is this. Our job is not to condemn, but our job is to evaluate. Our job is to use discernment and wisdom and to evaluate and then after proper evaluation, speak into the situation, speak into another's life in the appropriate way. So this is a challenge um, because you know people can be hypercritical and people in church can be hypercritical. We kind of sometimes fall into this accidental Pharisee pattern um, <clears throat> That's all about condemnation rather than evaluation. And that's not very helpful. In Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul actually addresses a group of believers that were hypercritical toward one another. And they were judging each other over what they ate and what they drank. And he says this, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? So this is the kind of judgment that has at its core this attitude of despising. To despise someone is essentially to condemn them. It is to uh, basically look down and be critical. It's to look at a person with contempt. Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So this has everything to do with motivation. So here, here's the question for you and me. Are we pointing out the faults of another person in a way that causes them to want to separate, be divisive, or is my intention actually to strengthen that person, and is it for that person's good and best interest? Because here's what we're after, Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. So here's what he's saying. I need you and you need me, and we need each other. See, we are called to look out for each other's best interests. So if I see a brother or sister going down the road that is gonna lead to all kinds of hurt, destruction, and pain, not only for them, but for those around them, I actually have an obligation to lovingly speak into that brother or sister's life and to give correction. That is to say, to judge appropriately what he or she might be involved in with the intention of bringing them back. And uh, this is actually one of the main reasons why Jesus formed this thing called the church. In 1 Peter, the apostle talks about how each one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're like this brick, or, or more specifically, he says, each one of you is like this stone, but this stone that is alive. And you know the purpose of you as a stone in part 
is that you would come together with other stones, living stones, and that you would be in really close proximity with other stones, and that as the stones come together, they build this structure that is the spiritual house of God. And you know what happens in the spiritual house of God? We look out for one another. That's what we do. We take care of one another. So if I see you doing something that is not in your best interest in violation of the scriptures, I need to lovingly come alongside you and say, hey, let me admonish you. You know, the word admonish literally means to place the mind. Literally what he's saying is, help a brother or sister remind them of what the scriptures call us to do and be. That's a judgment call. And we're not very good at it. We don't really enter into those spaces with one another where we're encouraging each other, building each other up, expressing all the one another's of scripture. By the way, this is why your participation within the Christian community is actually incomplete unless you are coming together with other Christians. Uh, Let me say that again. Your participation in the Christian community is actually, it's really not, it's really, you really don't have community if you're not in close proximity with other people where, where they can speak into your life and you can speak into their lives. And so, you know, the author of Hebrews says, let us not get into the habit of some who, it's like, they don't get together at all. You know, ever in a post-COVID world, you know, the, and I'm preaching to the choir right now, I know, but you know, in a, a post-COVID world, the average church attendee attends church 1.3 times a month. These are the people who would consider themselves, oh yeah, I'm a regular attendee. Before COVID, it was right at about 1.6 or so, 1.7, closer to two times a month. Now it's closer to one out of every four weeks. And it's really difficult to grow spiritually and to thrive if you are separated from the herd or the flock. And so Jesus dies to create this thing called the church. Like, do you understand how important this is? And part of the the importance of it is when we come together, we wanna be able to speak into each other's lives. And and this is also uh, another reason why it's it's so important to be involved in a, a smaller group, a group of individuals who genuinely care for one another. And without it, we won't grow. So what Jesus is after here is what he's been after all along in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all about the heart and the attitude that you have and to check yourself before you confront someone. Uh, This is why he says this in in the next verse, verse two. For with the judgment you pronounce, you're gonna be judged. And with the measure you use it, it's gonna come back to you, will be measured to you. So at this point, it's really important to understand who's in the crowd and, and part of who's in the crowd are this group of religious leaders known as the Pharisees and They were the ones that were the gatekeepers of religious life, or so they thought. They believed that if you wanted to please God, then you had to learn from them. The problem is they were adding rules. They added things on top of things. They were taking the the scriptures to places where God never took them. They were adding to the words of God and making it such a burden for the people. It's like, you wanna make God smile? Make sure you wash your hands in this way. First do this, then do this, and then do that. Have you done all those things? Okay, good. Now maybe God will be happy with you. So you can see why Jesus comes on the scene. He's like, it's not about that. It's about the condition of your heart. And you guys don't know who God is because you're wrapped up in all the rituals and traditions and you miss the heart of the matter. And if you judge people according to these strict external rules, then don't be surprised if it comes back on you. So Jesus isn't forbidding us to judge something um, He's not forbidding us to judge something that is sinful and to confront one another in love. What he says next, though, is how to do it properly. Verse three and four. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? Now, I don't know if this would have been comical in Jesus' day, but the word picture is kind of funny because it's like this. A person has a little bit of sawdust in his or her eye and the person next to them has a four by four post in their eye. 
And the person with the post in his or her eye looks at the brother with the little fleck of sawdust and says, oh, hey, I can see that little, that little chip of wood in your eye. Let me help you with that. But it's like they can't even get close. They can't get within eight feet of that person because it's like every time they do, they're bumping into things because they've got this big old pole sticking out of their eye. But they don't see it. And uh, Jesus has a word for this. Um, well, he calls it out. Verse five, it says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly, clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So here's what he's saying. The next time you and I are tempted to say something about the sin in another's life, you and I have to think about how guilty we are of that sin. And if we are guilty of it, then perhaps it's better just to remain silent and get help with our own junk first. It's the liar telling another liar to stop lying. It's the person who goes around talking behind everybody's back, telling another gossip, hey, that's not really something you should do. Who's gonna listen to you? What moral force or moral authority do you have if you're guilty of the same thing? And so this is yet another challenge with sin in our lives, is that it, it hinders uh, our ability to step into the life of a brother or sister and help give them correction. So back in the day, mirrors were not very common because they were expensive. They were luxury items. Um, even today, if you have something in your eye and you don't have a mirror, you might turn to a friend and say, hey, um, can, you, can you look and can you see, is there something in my eye? Because it feels like there's something in, in my eye. Can you, you know, can you see anything? And your friend looks and says, oh, actually, yeah, I do see something in your eye and you say to your friend, hey, would you, can you help me get it out? Can you help me? And your friend says, I can definitely help you with that. Wait here, let me go get my hammer. <laughs> and you're gonna be like, wait, stop. Hammer, no, no, we're not gonna do this with a hammer. You know what, you're right, you're right, you're right. You know what, on the end of my pocket knife, I have a pair of tweezers, hold still. You're still gonna be like, uh, I don't think so. So what do you, what's the process? Gentle maybe a little bit of water, maybe like you know a, a, a soft, really soft cloth, and you're gonna go in and you're gonna be as careful as possible. You're gonna be extremely gentle as you help that person remove whatever it is in their eye. Question, do you have people like this in your life? Maybe a better question. Are you this kind of person to others? That actually might be the answer to the first question. If, if we find that, you know what, I really don't have anybody like this in my life. Maybe, maybe, maybe it could be because we err on the judgmental side and not the loving correction side. And so we've got this pole length distance between us and the people we need to help, all the while not recognizing we ourselves actually are the ones who need help first. So there's a lot that Jesus is communicating in just these few verses. So there's one other danger that we have to be aware of, though, and that is the, the danger of criticizing others by our own personal standards. So I'll just use this as an example because it's super easy and simple. Maybe some of you were raised in a church where, let's say, the pet sin was drinking alcohol, right? And maybe <clears throat> uh, it was the kind of thing where alcohol was like a, you know, it was a particularly devastating sin. You know, I, I know someone that was raised in a home like this and, and it was like, man, you know, if, if people were drinking alcohol, it was like they were, you know, they were at least backslidden, if, if not on their way to hell, right? And she, this girl went over to a friend's house and opened up the refrigerator to get a little snack and saw that there was some alcohol in the refrigerator and she shut the door and she ran home because she was so scared of what she saw. Okay. So what's going on there? Well, let's understand, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible doesn't condemn drinking. What does the Bible condemn? It condemns being drunk. Um, if you're underage, well, then it's off limits because Romans 13, we wanna be good citizens and abide by those laws that don't interfere with what the scriptures call us to do. And, be, and so don't get drunk, no underage drinking. 
that's pretty clear. And then the Apostle Paul says, you know, the mature Christian, watch this now, has tremendous freedom. But the really mature Christian will put self-imposed limitations on his or her Christian freedoms for the blessing and benefit of others. Paul says, I don't want to be a stumbling block, so in any particular circumstance, I'm going to read the room, and then I'm going to act accordingly. Do I have the right to drink? Yes. Is it wise in this situation? No. Then I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. That's the mark of maturity. But what happens is people will condemn the things that the Bible doesn't condemn and say, because I don't do it, you shouldn't do it either. And if you do it, you're not a good Christian. Well, this is where, in part, we have to be careful that we don't become this accidental Pharisee because we're adding, taking away to what the scriptures say. So it's very easy for us to have this judgmental spirit in ways that are both small and big. Now, let me tell you what Jesus does in the very next verse. In the same way, he says that you, know, it's, you can waste your time by judging people inappropriately. You can also waste your time by trying to help those who are actually unresponsible. Do not give dogs what is holy, he says, and do not throw pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So I don't think it's difficult to understand what Jesus means by pearls. In this context, what he's talking about is the loving correction that you want to speak and bring to another believer's life. Not everybody will respond. In fact, some people, because they're super stubborn and very obstinate, and it's just an ego thing for them, you know, you might be right and you might be justified and you're good on this one and you want to step in and you really want to help another person out and yet they're like, don't talk to me. Don't you dare bring that to me. I don't want to hear it. And what Jesus is saying is, it's like you're trying to bring them pearls, but in this moment they're acting like pigs and pigs don't acknowledge pearls, right? They sniff it, they figure out if it's something they can eat and if not, they're just gonna trample it in the mud. You're wasting your time. Same thing with dogs. Back in the day, don't give dogs what is holy. So it's like you're trying to help. You know, you're trying to be holy and, and speak into this person's life, and they're not having it. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to give something precious to a, a dog. dog. Dogs back in the time of Jesus were not at all domesticated like the dogs we have today. They ran in wild packs. They were vicious animals. They were constantly digging up corpses and eating them. If you tried to get near a wild dog back in the day, there's a good possibility that you were gonna be attacked. And so this is very vivid imagery. It's like, listen, you wouldn't bring like, the, like a piece of Wagyu steak to this wild dog because as soon as you get near it, it's gonna take your hand off. And there are some people in life that are like those wild dogs. You get near them, you try to help them, and all they're gonna do is attack you. And Jesus says, you know, in some sense, um, that's a waste of time. What do you do? Well, you pull back, but you continue to pray. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends his disciples ahead to make preparation for him in the city they're about to enter. And a couple of disciples go and, and they're trying to find lodging and food and whatever they need, but the people in the town reject them. They're like, get out of here. We don't want to have anything to do with you. So the guys go back and report to Jesus. And they're like, hey, Jesus, it didn't go good for us in this town. In fact, when we got there, they told us to get out. So should we, should we, down, should we call down fire from sky and, 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 and just roast these people? Just totally flame this town because they rejected us. Jesus, should we do that? And Jesus is like, no, don't do that. If they don't respond to you, it's like shake the dust off your feet and just move on. So there, there may be people in your life that are becoming irritated with you because you're attempting to give them what they have absolutely no interest in. Does that mean you completely stop? Well, maybe, for now at least. But you can always pray that God would be doing a work behind the scenes, preparing them for the right opportunity. So understand, Jesus is not calling us to withhold judgment completely. What he's saying is, don't play the role of God. Your job is not to condemn, but to evaluate and to encourage your brother and your sister. Now, if you've talked to anybody who is in a recovery program, what they'll tell you is this. The thing that helped me the most 
was grace, mercy, compassion from those around me. Guys in recovery will tell you that. You know what they won't tell you? Yeah, you know what helped me the most? A judgmental, critical spirit. What helped me the most is when I walked into this place and everybody condemned me. It doesn't help you. So church, let's get it right. There's something here for all of us. If you don't allow yourself, if, you, if, you're, a, if you're dog-like or pig-like and you don't receive the loving correction that is spoken into your life, you will never grow spiritually. Uh, you just won't. You're gonna be like that living stone that's separated from the rest of the building. Uh, it's, it's very important to see ourselves on both sides of this equation, not only as one who needs to learn how to give the right kind of correction, but as one who needs to receive it. So I'm gonna have you bow your heads and close your eyes. This is, in large part, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life as well. And even in this moment, there may be something that the Spirit of God just is sort of nudging you with. And the Spirit of God is saying to you, let me lovingly remind you. Let me admonish you for your blessing and your benefit. What you're involved in, it's not giving you life, it's actually robbing you of life. So we don't want to be dog-like. We don't want to be pig-like. We want to receive it. Because what happens then is these, these, uh, these logs, they begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller until they disappear in our own hearts. And then that gives us the freedom to enter into this space and be someone who is used by God to be a blessing to those around us. This is what we need more of at Illuminate, quite frankly. And hey, listen, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna be because we come together and we're in close proximity with one another. So Father, just once again, just incredibly good words, just really profound and just so on point. And for those who are not yet in that relationship, with Jesus, what they're coming to understand now is what it means and what it looks like and the character and the quality of the Christian community. Lord, we don't always get it right, but in your goodness, you've given us the blueprints for having successful, meaningful relationships that build each other up. Lord, I pray that we would have the courage to step into that space for one another. We ask it all in the name of the one who makes it all possible, who who ultimately took all of our own condemnation, our own judgment upon himself. Therefore, there's no room for us to be that way towards others because it's just like the, the words of the hymn say, we're all wretches, saved by grace. And therefore, we wanna extend that grace to all those around us for our benefit and our blessing, but as always, ultimately for your glory, God. We ask it in the name of the one who makes it all possible. His name is Jesus Christ and God's people said, amen. amen. Stand with us this morning.
love to meet you. He'll be up on your left, and our prayer team will be up on your right if you need prayer today. Remember, there are going to be three services starting next week, 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. We hope to see you next week, and we hope you have a great week. Thank you.